every care And you will find him waiting The Prince of Life is there He flows in the river Soars on the summer air His love is all around you the Prince of Life is there. Open up your eyes. Breathe the The Prince of Life is everywhere. Good morning. My name is Mike Silver. I thank you for joining us this morning. The title of this talk is Perseverance. And we're going to start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us every day. And help us to be perseverance. Help us to have perseverance. Help us to persevere to your timing. We ask your touch on this talk. In Jesus' name we pray. We, I've got the, the turtle or the tortoise and the hare. You remember the fable? Okay, we want to be a tortoise when it comes to God. We want to be rushing. We want to take our time. Okay? You know, God expects us to honor Him, to thank Him for who He is and what He's done for us. He's our Heavenly Father. Without Him, we wouldn't even be here. And to top it off, he came and died for us. These are two huge reasons why we need to faithfully and consistently let God know we appreciate him and to bring Him, bring to him all our prayers and our concerns. You know, sometimes we get impatient with God when he gets off our timetable, right? This is where the rubber meets the road. Satan begins to whisper little sweet nothings of doubt in our ears. You know, like, why are you praying like this? Don't you have better things to do? God doesn't care about you or what you're praying for. You know, we're in a war, a spiritual war, and the battleground is between our ears. Listen to these verses. For though we walk in the flesh, or you could say, though we walk in an earthly way, we do not wage war in an earthly way. For the weapons of our warfare are not earthly but divinely powerful for the destruction of evil spiritual fortresses. That's from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4. For the flesh sets, sets its mind to wage war against the spirit, and the spirit sets its mind to wage war against the flesh. For these wage war against one another, Galatians 5, 17. And this is all happening in our mind. So how do we do this? How do we take to Satan and his kingdom of darkness? How do we get rid of him? How do we cast him and all the spiritual darkness junk out of our minds? First of all, we have to wait. We have to be patient. We have to persevere. We have to wait for God's timing. This is what God said to Abraham. I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you the, this land to possess it. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But afterward, they will return here for the iniquity or the sin of the Amorite is not yet complete. That's from Genesis 15. You know, God's telling Abraham that he will give the land of Cana, the land of the Amorites, to Abraham's descendants. But first, Abraham's descendants will be enslaved in a foreign land, Egypt. For 400 years then they will come out and possess the land the reason why they had to wait 400 years is because the iniquity or the sin of the amorite was not yet complete we can't just rush the field of battle there are certain things which only god knows that must fall into place before it's time to fight we have to wait for god's timing you know at the start of world war ii before the Allies had been able to make any significant advances against Nazi Germany and the Axis forces, Churchill sent his general, Montgomery, to Africa to stop Rommel and his armies. The British needed a victory for a much-needed boost in morale. 
Montgomery took over and began to train his troops. And he trained them. And he trained them. Churchill began to get impatient, and he threatened to replace Montgomery with somebody else. The general replied he wasn't taking his troops into battle until they were fully trained. Montgomery set a date and a time when he knew his troops would be ready, and he let them know the date. He positioned a huge battery of artillery guns pointing directly at Rommel's armies. As the time drew closer and closer to the artillery barrage, the anticipation grew and grew. One soldier said the air was so thick you'd be cut it with a knife. Finally, the appointed time came and Montgomery gave the order and the guns started firing. It was such a massive barrage and the troops were so well trained, Rommel's armies were routed and they never recovered. The church is in the same position of waiting and training right now. Listen to this vision about the end time given to the prophet Daniel. It's from Daniel 8. Daniel, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end when the transgressors have run their course. A king will arise, the Antichrist, insolent and skilled and intrigued. His power will be mighty and he will magnify himself in his heart. He will even oppose the prince of prince of princes, or Jesus, but he will be broken. The vision pertains to many days in the future. Now, if you notice in verse 23, we just read, it says, in the latter period when the transgressors have run their course. In other words, we have to wait for God's timings. We have to wait in an individual sense, in our own personal life, and we have to wait in a corporate sense for the whole church. God's predetermined spiritual cycles and seasons must play out. Genesis 15, 14 says we have to wait for the iniquity or for sin to be complete. Daniel 8, 23 says we have to wait for transgressors to run their course. Ezekiel 7, 10 to 12 says this, Behold, the day is coming. The rod has budded. Arrogance has blossomed. Violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain. The time for judgment has come. The day has arrived. God has appointed times. We must wait for it. We must persevere to. It's in the waiting. It's in the persevering where our faith is made strong, where we are made ready. First Thessalonians 5, 2 says, Jesus is coming like a thief, kind of like through the back door. Matthew 24, 44 says he's coming in a time. We think not. Matthew 24, 23 to 27 says he's coming in a way we think not. Many of Jesus' parables and instructions on how to prepare for his coming have to do with being on the alert. Stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Don't grow weary. Don't give up on God. Remember, he created us. He died for us. <coughs> Excuse me. He died for you. The Bible says his patience is for salvation. He is unwilling for any of his children to perish. We must persevere to God's timing. Galatians 4.14 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. At God's appointed time, at the fullness of time, God will send his Son into every one of our lives. Think about this verse. In light of the following story from the Gospels about a Gentile woman who approached Jesus, to heal her sick daughter. This is from Matthew 15 and Mark chapter 7. Okay, so here's this woman. She hears Jesus is coming to where she lives, and she thinks to herself, this is it. This is the time I've been waiting for. Jesus is coming. He can heal my daughter. This is the fullness of time for her. So she goes and hears Jesus speak, and he ministers to and heals the sick, so Jesus is through. The crowd is dispersing. Jesus and his disciples are packing up, getting ready to go. The woman thinks to herself, this is it. Now's the time. I got to go for it. She cries out, Jesus, son of David. No response. She says to herself, shoot, maybe you didn't hear me. I'll try again. Jesus, son of David. I don't know what the deal is. He should have heard me that time. I'm going to keep trying. 
Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now the disciples had had enough. They were tired of listening to this woman yelling at them. And furthermore, she wasn't even Jewish. She was a foreigner. So they said to Jesus, send her away. She keeps yelling at us. Jesus says to the woman, hey, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She says to herself, oh my gosh, finally a response. She goes and falls at Jesus' feet and implores Jesus, Lord, help me. Please cast the demon out on my daughter. She's cruelly possessed. Then Jesus speaks to her in what we would consider to be a rude and indifferent, cold-hearted response. I told you, I've come only to the house of Israel. These children must be fed first. It is not good to take the food from the children of Israel to feed the dogs. So do you get what Jesus is saying to her? He's explaining to this woman, you're a foreigner. You're not Jewish. He even insults her and calls her a dog. And says, I was sent to the people of Israel, not a dog like you. But the woman was undeterred. She says to herself, I'm not giving up. I waited too long for this moment to see my daughter healed. I'm not going to let Jesus get away that easy. This is where all the waiting, all the praying, all the perseverance, all the crying out to God in the middle of the night pays off. The woman gathers up her courage and responds to Jesus, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She is willing to accept Jesus calling her a dog and still reached out to him. Then the fullness of time really came in. Jesus came in. He stood up and turned to the woman and said, Oh woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Don't give up. If Jesus seems distant and he's not answering you the way you think he should, the way he says he would, keep after him. Even if he calls you a dog, keep after him. Persevere. The fullness of time will come. Jesus will really come. He said he would. Amen. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And help us to persevere, Jesus. Help us to persevere to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He gave you freedom. the fields of battle. We'll be like the turtle, the tortoise. Take our time, day after day. Keep after him. Keep after him.